Well, good morning again, and happy Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath. And welcome, uh, welcome to our humble little church here. Um, I'm glad that all of you were able to make it. You know, those who have heard me preach over the years know that I don't do themed sermons. So I don't do a Christmas sermon at Christmas or an Easter sermon at Easter or a Passover sermon at Passover. I just do whatever I'm in, impressed uh, to preach on. I pray about it, and I feel that the Holy Spirit impresses me. But at the end of the year, it's pretty much my custom that I want to talk about. You know, some people call the concept of New Year's resolutions, but it's really more than that. It's about our ability to sort of reset or reboot. Um, when I have, um, I have these thermal devices that I use, and there's something called a, a flat field correction. And what happens is as you use that thermal device and you scan and it's picking up all these heat signatures, it begins to fill up this microbolometer, it's called, and the, and the, the um, data that comes in from that fills up the, for no better explanation, the chip. And what it does, it has to flush itself to start over again. So it does what's called a flat field correction. Um, in, in the process of looking, you'll see the frame freezes and then it comes back on again and that's because uh, the device is refreshing itself. And that's how I feel sometimes by the end of the year that, you know, there's a saying and it says it's a cinch by the inch, meaning that sometimes changes occur so slowly that we don't really realize um, that they happen. I praise God every day for the concept of time, because if it wasn't for time, my whole life would occur in just a brief moment. And I don't think I could handle all that. I can't imagine being asleep for 30 years, getting up and looking in the mirror this morning and thinking, what happened to you, you know? And so the Lord allows these things to happen over time so that we can become gradually used to them. The downside of that is that bad behaviors also are more easily embedded when they occur over slow periods of time, over longer periods of time, and they happen slower. Again, a cinch by the inch concept that goes on. And so, you know, um, at any of you that use computers know that once in a while, you got to turn that computer off and reboot it, right? It's just the way it is. Your phones are the same way. The cache fills up. You got to reboot the phone and um, you have to empty the cache out in order for the phone to run good again. And I believe it's the same thing true for us, that by the time um, a year goes by or whatever, it's not... It's not um, a bad thing for us to look at rebooting ourselves and getting restarted. You know, it's interesting. I know the health message really well. I really do. I probably know it better than anything. Yet, I will pick up uh, councils on diets and foods, for example, and read it regularly. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Right? You ever do this where you go to a health seminar and they teach you all the things you already knew, but it recharges you again. You're like, reset to get started again. And that's kind of what this is about. So that's what I wanted to talk about uh, today. New Year's resolutions, yes, but more of a reboot or a new beginning for us as we start the new year. Mark 10, 27 says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. So in order for me to go forward with what might be called the New Year's resolutions, I have to look backward first. I have to reflect a bit on the past. One of the things I want to understand better is what lessons have I learned from this year, right? What things have I done right and wrong that have um, made life easier or harder, have advanced or digressed my spiritual uh, person? And, and, you know, uh, get a better understanding of the positives versus the negatives because I don't want to just look at the mistakes that I made. I want to put together a gratitude list for the great things that happened to me during this year because every year there's negatives and there's positives. We tend to focus sometimes on the negatives. I don't want to do just that. I have to set purposeful resolutions. I have to be realistic in my resolutions. I can't come up here and say, I want to deadlift 400 pounds by the end of this year because my spine will explode in the process. It just make a mess of everything everywhere. I have to have realistic expectations and I want to get away from the expectations that are worldly 
I want to take a look at things that are more spiritually oriented. I want to study the Bible more. I want to be uh, moved closer in my relationship with the Holy Spirit. I have this thing I do every morning. I have these three goals or purposes that I have in my life. And every morning I get up and I write them down once. That's all. Just write them down. I want to be more in tune with the Holy Spirit. I want to be more connected in God's will. And I want to be um, a better um, witness for those that are around me. I want to align my resolutions, if you will, with my values. And I want my values to be centered in spiritual uh, principles. I also want to, like I said, balance what I can do uh, realistically. You know, let me give you an example on that. Um, because what happens is, if I don't do that, I set myself up for failure. If I, if I make plans or goals or resolutions that are unrealistic, I set myself up for failure. And then when I fail, you know what? My brain says, huh, I knew you were going to do that. And then I don't want to do anything again. When, I, when, you, uh, uh, when you train, for example, a dog, when, when I went through this year's training with Gracie to be my service dog, one of the big, one of the hardest things, how many of you have had dogs, right? The hardest thing is to get them to come back when you call them, right? Recall is the most difficult. And so I worked on it slowly. I would start from a few feet away and across the room using really high value treats like chicken and, and beef liver and things like that. And I got to a point where she could be all the way across the property and I could yell, uh, Gracie here, and she would come running to me. And then one day uh, we're out there and the rabbit takes off from the palmettos and she takes off after the rabbit. If I yell here, she's not going to come back. And what I've done is I've destroyed that command. I can never use it again because from a dog's perspective, at least from what the behaviorists say, um, she knows that she doesn't have to come back now when I use that term. I don't want to set her up for failure. So what do I do? I let her chase the rabbit. That's all. And when she's done, hopefully she'll come back or she won't run in the street. We don't have control over everything that goes on in our lives, but we have to set realistic goals because if we set ourselves up for failure, that failure can cascade into many areas. Also seeking spiritual guidance. I want to be in prayer and meditation. I have to trust God, not only in the things that I think I want to do, I have to trust in God with regards to the timing. Those things will come about when I want them to come about. And finally, I have to get church and community support. I need an accountability partner. I need to have someone I can talk to to say, hey, you know, I, I was doing so-and-so today, or, or, you know, I made this commitment to read the Bible every morning and I didn't get to it today, you know, I, or, or whatever, whatever the resolution might be um, for me. And I also not only need someone to help encourage me, I need to be in a position to encourage other people. I find that the best way to get out of your own self is to help someone else get into their own self. And that will help us to become more aligned with, uh, with those spiritual principles because giving to others is a great way to get out of the own, our own failures, if you will, or the problems that we might have. So what is a resolution? Let's take it from the beginning. The Oxford Dictionary says it's a firm decision. Let's see what the Bible says. In Daniel 1, 8, 9, it says, but Daniel purpose, that's the word that it uses here, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. So think about this for us. If you're making a, a resolution, a health commitment for the year, and you're like, I don't know, those Christmas cookies look pretty good or whatever. Daniel, had he was exposed to the greatest delicacies that the king offered to, to all of his young, you know, whatever they were, his students that he, he was hoping to raise up into his government. And yet Daniel purposed in his heart. He made a commitment that he was not going to partake of those. And why was that? Was it just for health reasons, just because he wanted to feel better? Or was it because he had a spiritual connection? He had a commitment to God that he was going to follow those directives. It says, therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. What a risk he took to say, hey, I don't want to follow the king's directives. Can I have special dispensation from this? In Job 31, 1 and 2, this is one of my favorites. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust upon another woman. That's what he said. He said that I'm never going to do that. And it's a commitment that he made or a resolution that he made um, before God. 
all things are possible with Jesus. And sometimes what it feels like is that we can't set these goals, realistic or not, because it doesn't feel like we're going to be in a position uh, to be able to follow through. But in Mark 10, 23 to 27, this says, Jesus watched him go, then turn around and said to his disciples, it's almost, this is the, the well, hang on. I'm, I have another slide that gets into the history of it. But it says, it's almost impossible for the rich to get into the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples are like, well, if the rich can't, then who can, right? Because that's how we see things. Sometimes today we see the same thing. We might say, you know, it's impossible for a rich person to be able to, I don't know, do something. And we're like, well, if I'm not rich and they can't do it, how am I going to be able to do that? Because they have such a great benefit over, over me. And Jesus said it again. He said, dear children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? And this is what he's talking about. You know, I've heard people re repeat this and they say, money is the root of all evil. Is that what the Bible says? It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Greed is the eternal flaw for man, right? The love of money is what it is what it talks about. And we could replace that with anything that we place between God and us. Anything that becomes more important than our relationship with God that becomes an idol to us can be the root of all evil for us. It is easier for a camel, he said, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? Why would it be so hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because they don't rely on God. Right, they don't need to, right? Because they have everything that they need and they don't need help from anyone or anywhere else. At least they don't see that. Um, the disciples were incredulous. Then who in the world can be saved, they said, if not a rich man? Jesus looked at them intently and said, without God, it is utterly impossible. But with God, everything is possible. So is it impossible for a rich person to make it to heaven? Yes. Is it? The Bible says that with God, right, impossible. It's not impossible because it's not the wealth that keeps a person away from those spiritual commitments. It's the love of that wealth that separates them in their relationship from God. And I can only speak for me. If I'm separated in my relationship from God, I'm not going to make it to heaven. I know that. And he died on the cross so that I would have a promise of salvation, a guarantee of salvation. But I have to do my part as well. Um, being saved, that's a choice. Being lost, that's a choice also. And people have to make that choice. As a matter of fact, I think we're coming out of time to make that choice, actually. Change is the only thing that's constant in our lives. I always love that saying. My friend Henry P. Shaw used to say, why is it that if change is the only thing in our lives that remains constant, we never get used to it? Every time something goes on and it changes, we're surprised. Yeah, we are creatures of habit. You know what I love Paul always, it, it, uh, the Apostle Paul would say, he'd say, why do you act so surprised when these strange things happen to you? And, and I do. I act surprised still when those things come about. But for me in my life, what I've realized, at least in the latter parts of my life, that the change I've gone through has been for the better, Right? You know, we build faith this way. It's like working out. You have a little problem, you have a little faith, and, the, and God works to solve that problem. And what happens is it builds our faith. We're like, wow, that worked this time. Maybe it'll work the next time. And so we have another problem, and we rely on God to resolve that. We, we increase our faith, and the problem is solved again, and our faith begins to increase. Um, our ability to absorb the sometimes the trauma of change becomes easier over time if we reflect back on the positive changes that we've had over, over the years, even though they may be drastic sometimes. 
This is just somebody I heard say this once. I don't know who they are. They said, when the pain of where we are becomes greater than the fear of change, we become willing to change. I'm going to say that again. Because a lot of us are resistant to change and we can't change. We don't think we can change. And here's what he said to me. When the pain of where we're at becomes greater than the fear of change, then people change. I'd like to be able to get to that point before. I'd like to be able to change before it gets, let's say, to that point. But I can't always guarantee that that's the case. So what's the process for spiritual change? Let's talk about this. We have to deepen our faith in, Lord, in, in, in God. We have to become more trusting in the Lord and believe that, that by binding to the Holy Spirit that the right things will happen to us. Number two is we have to cultivate gratitude. Uh, I think this is the, the biggest um, a problem that we face. I know it is for me sometimes is having an attitude of gratitude. And when everything is going south, I tend to get into this whining, complaining place Instead of looking, instead of having an attitude of gratitude, and you know, we're told to be grateful for all things that happen. Why is that? Because we don't know at that moment what the long term impact of that is going to be. If we do the right thing, the right thing will happen. We don't always recognize it early on, but that is the case. We have to practice forgiveness. Forgiving others has become um, not difficult for me. I've really gotten good at forgiving other people because I myself have been such a terrible creature through my life that um, I would pray that other people would forgive me for the things that I have done. And I know that that doesn't happen until I practice forgiveness first. My hardest part, confession, forgiving myself. There are things that I've done in my life that today I still can't talk about and I haven't forgiven myself for. I know God has forgiven me. But the burden, the struggle, that's on me. That's because I haven't reached a point yet where I've been able to do that. I pray that I will um, at some point soon, actually, before I die, that I would be able to do that because I don't want to take those struggles to my grave. So I think we have to practice forgiveness not only for other people, but we have to practice forgiveness for ourselves as well. We have to strive to serve others. Again, the best way to get out of your own problem is to go out and help other people serve other people. Do it anonymously. That's what I love to do. I would tell you about some of the things I've done, but then they wouldn't be anonymous anymore. So just f find things that you can do to help people out at times and don't even let them know that it was you. Don't do it for the recognition. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Here's to me one of the most important is to live a life of honor, honesty, and integrity. Be a Marine, basically. You know, this is what we're talking about here. Um, honor, meaning that we respect um, ourselves enough that we do the right thing. Honesty, meaning that we believe that it's better to, um, uh, it's better to sacrifice um, a situation than it is to tell a lie. And integrity, integrity is where we stick to what we say. You know, who is the elephant in the Dr. Seuss book? I mean what I say, and I say what I meant. An elephant is faithful 100%. So how do we, why do we want to change? That's the next question that I had to answer. So again, my friend Henry would say, if what you're doing is working, keep, work, keep doing it. But if it's not, do something different. That was his sort of philosophy. In John 14, 15, we read, if you love me, you will obey what I have commanded. You will obey my commandments. Second Peter 1, 3 says, For as you know him better, he will give you through his great power everything you need for living a truly good life. So the one question I would start with is who here would like to live a truly good life? Would you? Want to live a good life? Because you don't have to. You can make a choice not to do that. Free will is still running rampant, right, through everybody. You might choose not to live a good life. You may choose to go a different direction because it's more fun, more entertaining, whatever it is. People do that every single day. But there's no way that we can, in, we can move forward in our spiritual lives if we, 
if we don't want to live a truly good life. Jesus says, I came here to give you life and to give you life how? Abundantly, that you might live life abundantly. He even shares his own glory and his own goodness with us. What does that mean? It means I don't have to look any further than what the Bible teaches me in order to get an example to see what a good life is because the Bible helps me to understand that. Next thing is, what do we want to change? Well, this becomes even more difficult. Number one, for me, I want to get rid of all those things that stand between me and God. So I have to look back over this year. I have to reflect. Say, what, what behaviors have I had? What things have I done? What, I don't know, my diet or my exercise or my Bible study or my relationships with other people. Is there anything there that stands between me and God? Do I have a resentment towards someone? Because that resentment could easily separate me in that relationship with God. So the first thing I want to change in, in whatever my resolutions or my reboot would be is I want to wipe all those resentments out, for example, that I have. And I want to start uh, from scratch. I want to practice forgiveness, practice gratitude, and get rid of those. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Therefore, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen? Then he said to all, this is Luke 9, 23 and 24, anyone who wants to follow me must put aside what? His own desires and conveniences and carry his cross with me every day and keep it close to me. All right. So the first thing is I have to do everything to the glory of God, no matter what it is, big or small, that's my first directive. The second is, is that I have to put all my own desires away. Everything that makes me feel safe and comfortable that's worldly, I have to get rid of and trust solely that the Holy Spirit is going to protect me, is going to take care of me, is going to provide me with all of my needs. So there are five steps I want to talk about quickly on to a spiritual growth. The first is we have to admit that we have problems, right? We have to admit that we have shortcomings, that there are things that stand between us and God. The second is we have to resolve, make a commitment to the change that we're about to embark on. Number three is we have to be willing to do our part. We can't ask God to change us if we're not willing to do a portion ourselves. The sermon last week, remember, we talked about self-control and self-discipline. Those are important factors in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We have to be willing to take the steps that we need to do um, in order to make this work. Number four is we have to be humble when we ask God for help. It's not an expectation. It's in humility that we, we bring ourselves to the foot of the cross before God. And the fifth is we have to believe that he's faithful and that he'll help us with those things that we're asking for. But remember, go back uh, many slides ago, and we also have to be willing to accept his timing. It'll happen in his time, not in our time. So we have to practice patience. That's why God gave us children. <laughs> so we could learn to be patient. I was thinking husbands. Husbands. It's real possible too. All right, step one, we have to admit our shortcomings. In Job 5, 8, and 9, it says, My advice to you is this. Go to God and confess your sins to him. So let's start there, right? Let's just go to God in our prayer closet, in our own private space, and let's confess those sins that we have to God. And here's, to me, why that has become easier to do over the years. Because God already knows it anyway. It's not like, I'm going to go confess my sins to God, and he's going to go, whoa, are you kidding me? You were doing that, right? I, I imagine in my own mind, God's going, wow, about time that you came to me with that. Because there's nothing that we hide from, from God. You know, we're in a society anymore where um, you can't hide from anything. You know, they have uh, license plate readers at every intersection now. Uh, they can track me all the way home and all the way back, the tolls, the license plate readers. My phone, it's not really a phone. What this is, is this is a tracking device 
that allows me to make phone calls once in a while. Matter of fact, you know what the least used app is on my phone? The phone app. That's right. And so this is nothing. And if I turn this off, they can turn it back on remotely. And I, I'm absolutely convinced of it because I've seen um, through some of the experiments they did at MIT that they can hear you when your phone's off because they can activate portions of the phone to work anyway. We are under surveillance at all times. Now, you may find a place where you can hide. Put your phone into a little Faraday bag. And that stops the signals. That's the only way to stop your phone from tracking you. Go somewhere where there is nobody. Disconnect the GPS from your vehicle. And you could be out somewhere and completely off grid. But that doesn't save you from God seeing what you do. So confessing our sins to him should become an easier process once we realize that there's no hiding those sins from God anyway. It says, for he does wonderful miracles, marvels without, without number. So I'm not, just convinced, con, I'm not just confessing my sins because I could feel, because it's an obligation that I have. It's because God can then work miracles in my life to bring me back around. James 5.16 says, this is the next thing, admit your faults uh, one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. So I've gone to God and I've confessed my sins. Once I, once I sort of get into this process, and, and um, I'm not saying become comfortable with it, but once I've passed that step, I need to go to my accountability partner and I need to confess, confess my sins to that person as well. God knows that person does not. Actually, in uh, the 12-step recovery fellowships, this is what's called a, a fifth step, where you go to your sponsor or somebody who's, who's a facsimile of your sponsor, and you basically confess, confess all this stuff. You get it off your chest. You get a person that you can trust, and you talk to them. The earnest prayer, it says, of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. Number two is make a commitment. Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Proverbs 16, 3 says, Commit your works to the Lord, and your thoughts will be established. Until you have the resolution to obey God's will, this is Miss White, um, you cannot have his guidance. You hear that? Until I've made a commitment, I've resolved um, uh, that, that this is um, Dave, or Daniel purposed in his heart. Until I purpose in my heart that this is the change that I want to go through, then there's no way God can step in to the equation. I've got to be willing first. Basically, this is getting rid of all your reservations. I think I told you the story once. I had a friend of mine. He had... Uh, Quit smoking finally. I mean, I quit 150 times before I finally stopped, right? Stopping isn't the problem. Stopping, stopping is what the problem is, right? And so he finally had given up smoking cigarettes, and we were going lunch somewhere, and he picked me up, and in his car he had this thing hanging from the, the mirror. It was kind of funny in a way, but it was like a little glass sealed tube, and it had a cigarette inside of it, and it said, break in case of emergency or break glass in case of emergency. That is a reservation, right? To me, I know that it's kind of funny, maybe it's a, it was a joke for him, but what it says to me is that when push comes to shove, if everything falls apart, I can still smoke that cigarette rather than turning to God, to the Holy Spirit, and getting my comfort that way instead of having to go to something external. Uh, we have to... to um, purpose in our hearts um, what our change is going to be, but we can't expect God to guide us. Number three is to do our part first. Uh, there's an old saying I heard once, many times, and it says, God can move mountains, but you got to bring a shovel. We have a part to play in this. You know, when I, I did this one time at another church and someone came up and said, oh, you're talking about works. Works doesn't get us to heaven. No, but faith without works is what? Dead. 
dead. What does that mean? If I am faithful to God in all the things where I should be faithful, then my actions are going to reflect that. If I want forgiveness, I got to forgive. I, I have to, to be active in my role in this. I can't ask you guys to come up and, and help me, you know, cut wood at the house if I'm just going to sit around and sip on an iced tea and watch you do it and not participate or not get involved at all. I have a part to play in this. Um, we, you know, we come to church and, and we want to get things done. Well, you know, you have to be involved in getting it done. That's what I loved about what Pastor Tony used to do. Somebody come up and have a suggestion. We should do this with the youth. And he'd say, that's great. That's your job now. You know, that's what you get to do. And, and bring it to me when you, when you figure, figure it out. You know, uh, James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, what does that mean when he's been approved? For when he has gotten past that temptation without acting on it, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So can I control being tempted? I, I don't think so. Not for me. I mean, there's temptations everywhere. And sometimes I got to catch myself. You go that, you know, slap yourself back into reality or something, you know? Um, and then I have to, I have to get past that part of it, but I have to take action, you know, to do that. I have to step away from a situation. I have to turn and look at a different place. I mean, there's all kinds of temptations that come to us all the time. And if, if I act on those, that's on me. Far be it for me to ask God to come and intervene if I'm not willing to, to stay the course and do the right thing anyway. I'm not going to ask for help from someone if I'm not willing to do it myself. I, that's something I learned in the military. You never ask your men to do something that you aren't willing first to do. You know, many, many years ago, I was a, 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 the CEO for this hospital. And um, um, I used to go out once in a while and I'd take the riding mower and I'd mow the yard just because it's okay you know it's okay for us to do things without if we're going to ask other people to do things we need to be willing ourselves to take those steps as well philippians 2 12 and 13 says therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only what does that mean right even when they were out on their own when you're when you're out somewhere and you're off the grid is what it's saying. But now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I believe that if Jesus was here right now, he was at my house staying with me, it would be a lot easier for me to, to do everything the right way than to not have him at my house with the constant reminder that he's there in front of me. But he's saying even more importantly than when I'm there with you, because that's easy. How about when I'm not there with you? Because that's hard. But I have to purpose in my heart that I'm going to do those things. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Number four, we have to humbly ask him for help. Our only safety is in constant distrust of self and dependence on God. Read to 2 Corinthians and we talk about the, the Bible there actually talks about why we suffer. You know, I hear this all the time. Why do bad things happen to good people? If there is a God, why do we have to suffer? Read through 2 Corinthians, especially chapters 1 through 3. And one of the things he talks about in, in there is so that we recognize that we're not in control, that God is in control, right? Because if it was too easy and, and we just skated through everything, Oftentimes, we wouldn't feel like we needed God. You know, we just walk through life without any problems. I can just tell you that when I am faced with a struggle, sometimes that reminds me, you know, that I need to turn to the Lord, that God's in control. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in what kind of time? Due time. I want you to remember that as we go through this. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Uh, I didn't give, did I not give the reference to that? I'm so sorry. I will get it for you. 
But though the Lord has freely given us all things richly to enjoy, it is essential that we pray to him in order that he may bestow upon us his gifts. There is no uncertainty as to what will be the result. The promise is what? Ask and you will receive. Watch unto prayer and be assured that the re representatives of Christ are close beside you. When you are placed in circumstances where you are tempted to, forget that you are not your own to do with yourself as you please. I am, I belong to the Lord. I'm his property, basically. What I do to myself reflects on my love for Christ. If I do injurious things, if I don't take care of myself, to me it says that I disrespect God. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in that uh, position. Finally, believe that he is faithful. Ask and you will be given what you ask for. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone, how many people? Everyone, everyone who asks, what happens? They receive. Who, anyone. So not just everyone now, anyone who seeks does what? If you will knock, the door will be open. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. And 1 Corinthians 10 to 13 says, No temptation, this is one of my favorite verses again, has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Basically it's saying quit, quit feeling like you're the lone ranger out there, okay? Nothing, there's nothing new under the sun, says Solomon. Nothing has happened to you that hasn't happened to somebody else already. And my goal is, is to be able to, to take those things that have happened to me. I am today the sum total of everything that's occurred in my past. Um, I have a few regrets, you know, but it's okay. But I wouldn't have changed anything. Because the person I am today, up in the pulpit of this church, bringing myself to the foot of the cross, having faith and confidence in God to handle everything, the only reason that that's who I am today is because of who I was in the past. So why would I want to change anything that happened in the past if it got me to this point in God's time? Maybe I think, oh, I could have gotten there sooner. I don't think so. You know, if I really believe that, that, that God has a plan, you know, and that all these things work for good to those who love the Lord, I have to believe that I am here today uh, because of all those things that I have done. But nothing that I've experienced was unique. You know what I like to do? I like to take those things that happened to me because I've come out the other side and be able to help another person who's going through those same things. And in 2 Corinthians, it talks about that. Why do we suffer? So that we can provide the comfort to others that God provided to us, not so that we can be comfortable but so that we can help to comfort others in their own problems. It says, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. All it requires is 100% total submission to God. That's it. Real easy, right? You just got to give everything up, turn it all over to God, and stop trying to take control of it. In Christ's Object Lessons, Miss White writes this. Let no one say, I cannot remedy my defects of character. If you come to this decision, so basically, if you get into this Eeyore mindset, you know, happy birthday, Eeyore, and what does he say? Oh, what's it matter? Nobody remembers anyway, right? He loses his tail, and he's the most depressed person around. If I come to the decision that I cannot remedy my defects of character, it says you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. When you set your goals and objectives, do not set yourself up for failure. Don't be unrealistic in the things that you are looking for. You know, I'm going to study my Bible two hours every morning, the first thing when I wake up. Well, that's not possible sometimes. You know, Don't set yourself up for failure. The impossibility lies where? In your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness 
to submit to the control of God. Amen? Amen. Doris, you're up. I know usually it says in closing, but I forgot to do that this time.